Today, as I was saying, we're concluding our serving series, and it's called We Serve One Another. And I'm very passionate about this topic because I have the honor of being the pastor that oversees many volunteer teams as part of what I do here at Life Center. And when you walk through the door, you would have bumped into some of my volunteers from ushering to greeting, cafe, checking in your family. All of the volunteers that are serving in this main area are under and partnering with my ministry. And I'm so great. Actually, I get to partner and serve them. They are just such a gift in our lives and in the life of the church. And so I want to say that this topic of serving is something that is so passionate to me. Because when I was a little girl, I watched modeled serving in the church. It was something my parents did through good and bad times. Through lots of changes in the church, they stayed connected and rooted in and served. And it became a natural part for me in my teenage years. I served in the church. And I believe that was critical in me growing in my faith. I was rooted and connected in a church. But I started with serving. And God just used that to really speak into my heart and to grow me spiritually. And that has continued as we've raised our kids. It's part of our Corto family that we give back to Life Center, not just because we're on ministry, on this ministry team, but because this is our family. You're our family. And this is our home. I said, this is going to be the biggest house I own on this side of heaven, 2214 Innes Road. This is one of my houses. I love it. This is your family. This is your home. And this is part of our family has been a value of serving. Because it's not just about what we give and what we do, but it's about what we also receive through serving. So I want to unpack that today. One another happens 94 times the New Testament alone. And a third of those times that one another is mentioned have to do with unity. A third of the other one another's have to do with loving one another. And 15% of the one another's left have to do with humility. That word humility is the heart of how we serve. Unity, loving one another, and humility. For we cannot have united hearts to serve one another if we don't have humility. We cannot truly love one another if we don't have humility. And I can't help but think of the scripture found in Philippians 2.8 that says, And being found in appearance as a man, we're talking about Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. There is no greater example of humility. The Son of God took on the appearance of a man. The divine came to earth. And died for us, not only died for us, but was crucified to rise again. He humbly came in obedience to the Father. And that is the greatest example that we have. For serving is intentional and is action-filled. There's a statement I want to read from this morning. And I just want to pull a few key words from it that I'm going to build a message from. And it says, we serve God by serving others wholeheartedly. Our service positions us to best see others. We care about people first before we think about what they can offer. And we endeavor to look for the best in others. So I'm going to pull some words here. I'm going to reread that statement. We serve God by serving others wholeheartedly. Our service positions us to best see others. We care about people first before we think about what they can offer. And we endeavor to look for the best in one another. I want to break it down in these three mess, these three words. God, see, and look. So how do we serve God by serving others? Well, I'm going to bring us back to a Jewish prayer that's prayed morning and night. And it's a beautiful scripture. And it's called the Shema. Because I think the answer might be counterintuitive. And it says in Mark 12, 30, to 31. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment than these. This is a commandment from God. This is not my words. This is not Life Center's motto. This is a commandment. It starts out with saying, you shall. And it ends with, there is no other commandment greater than these. That we shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we shall love others as we love ourselves. 
That is so important for us to understand today, that this is the words of God. You may say, listen, I serve God and I attend church, and that is wonderful. We need to come together to be a part of a church family. It's really important. Something supernaturally happens when we put that as a priority in our lives. But attending church is good, but it just puts us in proximity with one another. You may say, I use my spiritual gifts, and that's wonderful. But our spiritual gifts only create awareness with one another and what we're able to give. You may say, listen, I serve God and I've joined a team. That is fantastic. And as someone that oversees many volunteers, yay, please, we need you. We really do need everyone. 120 per people per service is needed. It's a lot. And we're building this service. And so thank you for those of you that have stepped in and those of you that are feeling God tug on your heart to do that. We need you. It's wonderful and fantastic. But it only creates movement with one another. As much as all of this is needed and all of this is highly valued, the greatest gift is not just in what you do, but in how you fulfill your call to serve one another. It starts with being wholehearted. And what do I mean by being wholehearted? It's allowing Jesus to bring ongoing healing into your heart. That's what wholehearted means. He is first and foremost. His work in our lives is where everything will flow from. This has got to be a priority. This has got to be the area that we focus on first with God so that we can flow with God out of a place that is wholehearted. And I want to say from the pulpit very honestly and openly that if this is multi-layered inside, it's complex. We are spirit, soul, mind, and body. And if you are needing professional help, there is zero shame in that. Zero shame. Because God's heart is that we would find hope and healing and freedom. And that journey can look different for all of us. But that is the heart of God, that we would come to him first, that we would bring our hearts to him, asking him to heal and restore us and trusting him with the journey of how that is walked out and lived out in the process of that. Now, I've been a Christian for almost 40 years, and I don't want to discourage you, but this is an ongoing journey. I feel like every day I wake up and I feel like I've just started over. Oh, God, that's still there. Pride, pain, selfishness. My brokenness, it's right there. But it's not meant to condemn me. God, the Holy Spirit doesn't bring that to my heart and enlighten that to condemn me. It's for me to bring it somewhere, and that's to bring it to the cross so I can be fully healed, fully restored, and been given hope and freedom in Jesus Christ alone. When we are unable to love ourselves, when we are unable to allow God to do that healing, it is very difficult to truly love others. It's almost impossible to truly love others if we don't really allow God to show us how much he loves us and to have that healing in our hearts. Now, I am not preaching a me first approach to the gospel. I want to be very clear about that. I am preaching a God first and loving myself in an honoring way that honors God, not in a selfish way that motivates value coming from what people think of me. I am not preaching that gospel today. I am preaching the gospel that says that he's first and he wants to use my life in a great way. God wants to heal, remove, and break hindrances that keep getting in the way because we cannot fully operate as a full, pure flow of God's love if there are those blockages inside of us. We need him to heal us. For our greatest strength is divinely tied to our deepest struggle. Our greatest strength is divinely tied to our deepest struggle. I've been independent, determined my entire life. And it's been actually a real wonderful gift that God's given me in leadership. I've taken lots of risks. I've, it's, been work, it's worked something really well out in my leadership skill. And I'm so grateful for that. It's been a strength in my life as a leader that I've been independent. And I've been able to step out with determination to see something and to run hard for a goal. But I tell you, my strength in that is also my weakness with God. It's the area that God has also put his finger on. 
because I cannot be independent from God. I need to be wholly dependent on God. I can't run ahead of the goals and the things that I feel I need to do without saying, God, what is your heart for me to do? Give me the mind that you have and the heart for what you have, not just what I want to do. Because I don't know what my motives are. You do. So help and lead me. In my marriage, that independence becomes a weakness if I don't, in a healthy way, become dependent with Jay to build a healthy life together. Our strength is linked with our weakness. I love working with people. I've had people skills for as long as I can remember, and I love it. I love being with people, working with people, all different personalities. But that is a strength here, but in this sense, it's been a weakness where I've looked for validation and affirmation and approval from people. My strength is divinely linked to my weakness and my struggle. If you're naturally bold and courageous, you might be a bit of a bulldozer in relationships. I saw some of you look to one another. (laughs) You might be empathetic and sensitive, but you might be prone to be overwhelmed and you can lose yourself and your voice in a relationship. God does not want to bring healing into our lives to weaken our strength, but to make whole where we struggle. God doesn't want to come into my life and weaken the independence where I'm able to take a stand and be able to be bold for things I feel very convicted on without working a wholeness that that comes out of a place not out of pride, but out of humility and dependency on God and on his word to have a revelation, and to do it with love every single time. Our strength is tied to our deepest struggle. For our strengths in serving are meant to bring people closer to Jesus, that we serve with intention and spiritual awareness. And there is a picture that Pastor Jay had painted last year, and it so impacted me about the Father's table. Do you all remember that the message is about the Father's table, that there's room at the table for you? And I think of this often when I think of serving because my favorite scripture is found in Mark 10, 45, one of my favorites. And it says, for the son of man did not come to be served, but to be to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. For the son of God did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That is a deep revelation that we have to have in that, that God served us something we could never attain on our own. And today, we need to come fresh with these hearts that need healing and restoration to pull our chair up to the table of God, to that beautiful table that he has reserved a spot for just you and just me as his child, and to say, daughter, what do you need today? What can I give you today? Even though God knows everything, he loves to hear his children say, God, I'm weak, I'm tired, I'm anxious, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I've sinned, I'm in pain. And he's like, give this to me and I'm going to serve you today. Love and grace and mercy and wholeness and forgiveness because that is the God we serve that he held nothing back to send his son to serve us. And daily at the Father's table, there is a serving for you. Daily. Daily there's a serving for you. Amen. And that is the most beautiful, divine exchange that happens when we pull up to the table and we let go of all the weight that we're carrying and God gives us the lightness and the freedom, and the hope that we so desperately need because we cannot do it on our own. It is only by the grace of God. Today, what are you needing at the table that only God can give you? What man gives is very short-lived, and it does not nourish and satisfy. What God gives is the bread of life, the well that will never run dry, and the sustaining power of his presence that only comes from feasting on God's presence and the word and what he gives so lavishly, without partiality. 
It is from his heart for you because you are his daughter. You are his son. And today is a new day. And if you've walked through this door today, I feel like there's someone here today that walked in and said, if only you knew. If only you knew the mistakes I made yesterday. If only you knew what I've been struggling with. I don't need to know because God knows. And today is a new day. That's why he says, great is my faithfulness. My, new, my mercies are new every morning. Today is a new start for you. Come to the table. Don't wait. The chair has been pulled out for you. Your father is waiting for you. And he wants to redeem all that the enemy steals and robs and destroys in our life. We don't have to dig deep to discover brokenness. <laughs> it's right there. But God has the answer to wholeness and wholehearted living. In serving others, we've talked about serving God first and allowing him to serve us what only he can serve in the divine, only by his hand. In serving others, we must also see and in seeing, I mean seeing our significance. God loves you, and he made you with a purpose. You have a natural fingerprint that is like no one else's, and you have a spiritual fingerprint in the kingdom of God that is like no one else's. God has made you unique. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, as it says in Psalm 137. You are his. You are beloved he is working all things together for your good, from your past to work it for good, to use it for a unique purpose and plan. We need you in the body of Christ. And I love that Paul talks about that, how we are woven together. We need one another. I need what you, need, you bring to the body of Christ. You need what I bring to the body of Christ. No one can take your place in the body of Christ. No one can take your place in the kingdom of God. You are unique to what God has in this time, in this purpose, in this season for this world. And 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the body of Christ. And he uses that illustration of a body. If I was to look at my physical body Everything is working together. Everything is connected. Everything has a purpose and moves that I don't even realize. Until I became iron deficient, I didn't know how much my low, lack of iron could create so many problems. I didn't even know. But the body, it was like a domino effect. Everything in our body is divinely connected to work for health and wholeness. We would never say about our body, whatever is visible is the most valuable. My nose is more important than my heart. My eye than my, than my brain. My fingers and my organs. We would never say that. Everything is vital to work together. But how often in our spiritual lives, in our spiritual body, as us being the body of Christ, do we equate value to visibility? I want to say that again. How often do we equate value to visibility? Because I'm not doing something on stage or something in leadership or something that people notice, it's not as valuable. That is not the word of God. And that is not how God sees the body of Christ some of the most inspirational people I know definitely are on stage delivering the word. Others, you will never know their names. They're the ones that show up at a hospital when an elderly lady has no family and just needs someone to hold their hand. That comes and volunteers with the babies so that you can be in the service today. The ones that make the meal for the single mom that just feels overwhelmed or the one going through cancer that wants to give a bit of hope to say, we see you, we love you. That show up early on winter mornings to salt the parking lot. That turn on all the lights when you come or has the lyrics and all the PowerPoint going that was prepared way in advance. You may not know their name, but God does. We need you. We need you to be you. And not to compare yourself to anyone else. That grieves the heart of God. As a parent, when I look at my daughters, I don't want one of my daughters to be like the other. I want them to fully be 
who God has created them to be. And I'm a natural parent. I can't imagine the heart of God, how it breaks when we compare ourselves with one another and we try to be like one another and we diminish our value according to what we see with our eyes versus who we are in Christ and that we do it for his glory, for his name, and for his fame. That is what he sees. And that is what God values. Church, when I was preparing this message, this was sitting on my heart so heavy. The significance each of you have. And until you allow God to do healing deep in your heart, coming to that Father's table and allowing him to do that divine exchange daily, moment by moment sometimes, we cannot have that deep revelation of the significance that we hold. That has been the truth in my life. I don't understand the significance of what I do if I don't have my time with the Father. Because it's not in what I do. It's in how I fulfill that call in honoring God. You are all significant. I want to talk about now looking. So we've talked about God. We've talked about seeing, which is very present. Now I want to talk about looking. And looking is different than seeing. Looking has an expectation, an anticipation to it. If I'm looking for something, I, like in Psalm it says, I look to the hills from where my help comes from. I'm looking. I'm anticipating something to come. And I love the word expectation. I love the word expectation because it has to do with something that I need that's coming. And I want to share with you the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to use the story of Peter. Peter, I love. I actually love Peter. He's bold. He's independent. He's courageous. He's a strong leader. I love Peter, and I identify with Peter. I love, love Peter. We give him a hard time, but Peter's a pretty good guy. Peter, natural-born leader, born with boldness and courage and strength. And I think of the story when he was, Jesus was about to be arrested, and he says to Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And what does Peter say? Pff, never. He's probably looking around the room at the disciples saying, of all of them, I'm definitely not. Maybe him, but not me. Who knows what Peter was saying? I paraphrase that, by the way. But he did not feel that that would be something he would ever do. In his natural strength, he was like, I am brave, I am bold, I am courageous. But what happened? Peter denied Jesus three times. His natural strength failed. He needed to look to something greater than what he was able to do on his own. We also see of Peter walking on the water with Jesus. His, his, Jesus' disciples are in a boat. Jesus comes on the water walking. How amazing. I would love to have seen that. He walks on the water and all the disciples think it's a ghost. They're so scared. Who's the only one that gets out of the boat? Peter. We kind of rag on Peter, but I'm like, good job, Peter. You got out of the boat. He gets out of the boat. He starts to walk. His natural strength fails. The courage and boldness and bravery fails, and he starts to sink. Spoiler alert, he does get rescued. <laughs> he doesn't drown. He's okay. But in that moment, his natural strength failed. He needed to look to something greater than him greater than what he was able to do with a heart that loved Jesus, with strengths that were incredible, there was something he needed and was missing. We now look at Acts 2. And after Acts 2, there's a different Peter. Same strength, but now filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. All of that working together created an extraordinary journey for Peter, who had denied Christ and was restored, who jumped out of a boat, almost died, but God saved him. An amazing journey began with Peter where the boldness and the strength continued to operate in his life, but now filled with the power of the Holy Spirit where he was used to bring the gospel to the Gentile world. And 
we're still reading about Peter and the letters that he wrote. Peter was used in an extraordinary way because that is God's heart for us, is that we would have an expectancy that when we align our hearts to God and say, God, I need you to heal me, and when we bring our gifts and our strengths, which are his anyway, he gave them to us. They're not even ours. So who, who of us can say, no, God, you can't use that. He gave it to you. We give the gifts back to the giver. And then we step in under the power of the Holy Spirit. What we do is filled with power and strength and truth. And it doesn't matter the significance we may feel as far as visibility, the significance comes because we're following the Father's heart. We're doing what we're only asked to do that day by God. For your journey, that is critical for you moving forward. That you say, God, how have you made me? May I fully embrace that. For some of you, that might be the journey that you have to fully surrender and trust like, God, you've made me this way. My journey looks like this, and I'm going to let go of bitterness. I'm going to let go of disappointment. I'm going to let go of what I wished it would have been. And I'm going to trust that I am exactly right now who I'm supposed to be in you because I'm your daughter and you have a plan. The Father's table is right here. He's with you right now. And I want you to picture yourself pulling your chair up to the table. I want you to close your eyes. And I want in your mind to say, God, what do I need from you today? Please serve me with that bread, that true life that I need. Do I need forgiveness today? Do I need real peace do I need freedom from fear and anxiety? Do I need just to know that you love me? Just take a moment to ask God that right now. God, we thank you that you serve us with the greatest lavish love. I thank you, God, that you are never a no-show. You are always there. Whether I see it or not, when I pull my chair in, you are faithful and you love me. And I thank you for that revelation for everyone here today, that there is a place for them at your table. There's a significant place for them in the body of Christ. And God, there's a significance that comes with the power of the Holy Spirit you want to use their life in, beyond what they could even imagine. We come to you, the author of all. We surrender to you. We want you to have ongoing freedom to heal our hearts. We want to be wholehearted for you, God. We want to live for you in a way that's not about us, but that you're the hero of every single story that is written in our chapters. You are the hero. And we are so humbled by your love and grace. And we're so drawn to your heart because it's good. It's good. Thank you, Jesus.